plan is always we're going to go to film festivals we're going to get into sundance yeah we're going to sell for a million dollars and uh and we're going to be a huge success every every filmmaker feels the same way my <laughs> Do you put up a uh, little shorts on YouTube or anything, or do you? Ju- is it always just a bigger picture of just your movies? No, you know, uh, I've been doing little shorts with my kids. Just YouTube. My kids love YouTube. Yeah, um, yeah. Every kid loves YouTube. It's you know, parents' worst nightmare. Um, but my kids want to make movies now. They see me doing it, and I invite them to set, and I kind of get them involved, and they can act in it if they're if they want. And same here. And same here. <laughs> Now they, yeah, you can see they can't even do a Zoom call without them coming in. <laughs> so they want to make movies themselves and uh, and they like to put them on YouTube. And so what I started doing was we, we made a, a couple of small ones with them. You know, they're not, they're just fun, just to have fun and uh, and to get them going. But I, I had um, I'd done a couple short films before I moved on to features. Um, I did a 35 millimeter short film, you know, back in the day when, film was a, a real thing and yeah i just uh, eventually i knew i'd always wanted to make features though mm-hmm. so you know it's the next logical step so worst christmas ever what is that about worst christmas ever be the worst person fourth of july <laughs> yeah so well what's crazy is uh worst christmas ever is a um a dark comedy drama about a teenager who finds out she's pregnant on Christmas Eve. So it's her, it's her point of view. That's where worst Christmas ever comes from. Um, and, and it's like worst period, Christmas period, ever period. Kind of how a teenager would, would text it to her friend. Um, as I mentioned before, I needed, a, I needed a story I could do cheaply. Uh, a teenage drama, teenage comedy fit that, fit that bill well. And I happened to have a 16 year old niece when I moved back to Ohio, she was 16. And I said, you know, what's, what's her worst Christmas ever, right? What would, what would be her worst situation? Of course, coming home and telling mom that you're pregnant would be horrible, right? Could couldn't even imagine what, what that must be like. So that was just where it came from the, the general story. Um, you know, I also wanted to challenge myself. Uh, most of my screenplays at that point had all been pretty male centric, kind of you know male dominated movies, um, and and I wanted to challenge myself and write a a, a, a script about a, a, a the lead character a female, and give a, a different perspective and try to challenge myself a little bit. So it was a good exercise there, and yeah, the movie. Uh, uh, it's funny you mentioned politics. This was 2016. Uh, I, I follow politics as well. I'm, I'm uh, just kind of, I like to watch. It's a, it's a sport, you know, almost. Yeah, it is. Um, and in Full 20- contact, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and it, what's funny is uh, Youngstown, Ohio, just fun fact here, was a big union town for many, many, many years. Was a, was a Democrat stronghold. And in 2016, it started to flip a little bit, right, with Donald Trump. And, uh, and I noticed that and I said, wow, that's, that's a, there's a big shift happening here. And it was at that moment in time where I believe Hillary Clinton called Trump supporters depl- a basket of deplorables. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, there, it, was, it was a lot of venom going on. Both sides were kind of back and forth at each other. Like you said, full contact. And, uh, and, and that spirit in that moment in time shaped the story. And I, I, I thought, you know, how, how interesting and funny would it be to me if everybody in this movie was deplorable? That word, that word, you know, that basket of deplorables. I thought, well, these are real people, right? They're not, yeah. you know, you can label them whatever you want, but they're real people. They're real people in flyover states. They're real people in Ohio. They're real people wherever. So the movie is not political at all, but it was written 
and born in that moment of the 2016 election. I wrote it from September to November, uh, just wrote it every day until I had a finished script. Uh, and, and, and right after that election, I finished the, the script. So we set off in production over the next two and a half years, basically, piecemealing it together. We had, we had to keep stopping every time we ran out of money. Yeah. We'd go back to work and raise more money. And uh, once we got it done, like I mentioned, uh, Joe Vaglica came on at the end, helped us get to the get to the finish line. We didn't know what the next step was. We said, what are we going to do? How are we going to distribute it? And 2020, the year, the new year came and we were looking at different options and film festivals. And then all of a sudden COVID hit. And, you know, film festivals are not really an option now. You know, people you can watch online, I guess, but they're not the same. It's not... Uh, not the same experience but again we just got real lucky and and timing it turned out to be the worst chris the worst year ever right <laughs> so you know we we built a social media presence we're uh, we've got over five thousand followers and likes on facebook we've got um, our videos on facebook have a ton of hits uh it's gotten a big following on on facebook so uh, the, the distributors actually reached out to us. They found us and they said, hey, you know, we, we see what you've got going here. We, we'd like to check out your movie, uh, send it to them. And they made us a deal. They, they made us an offer. And, uh, and this was a really big distributor because uh, they got us out on Google Play, iTunes. Uh, you're on camera, bud. Hey. You gotta get out. Close the door. Right? <laughs> so, like a little dog. On, yeah, I know, right? We're on Google Play. We're on Google Play, iTunes, Amazon, uh, YouTube. These are to rent and buy the movie. Um, Armstrong Cable, Comcast, Xfinity on demand, Dish on demand. Um, you can let them in. We got a pretty big distribution platforms going on. You can let them I'm, I'm sure that was your goal. But if they wouldn't have reached out to you, what, like, were you still gonna, did you know how to go about this to get the, to go you down know, this road? I think every, every filmmaker uh, yeah. wants to do their, their plan is always, we're going to go to film festivals. We're going to get into Sundance. Yeah. We're going to sell for a million dollars and, uh, and we're going to be a huge success. Every, every filmmaker feels the same way. My, we were included. Um, and, and when, when, the coronavirus hit and film festivals didn't really look like an option anymore. We didn't know what to do. We, we, we thought, okay, we might have to distribute this ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and so we really started researching and doing, doing, um, you know, a lot, a lot of research about how to go about that. If, if we needed to, uh, we were looking at sales agents. We were trying to figure out where we could, where we could go from there and we didn't really have the you know a, a full roadmap i don't know if anybody has a roadmap mm -hmm. to get it out there um but we lucked out in the sense that we had a very marketable genre which we knew that going into it we, we were making a a christmas movie which is technically it's a sub genre right but it's a, a very popular one, very niche kind of audience. Mm -hmm. um, and so every year, these, you see, Lifetime and, and all these channels, they have a million Christmas movies oh, yeah. every year. And people can't get enough of them. They, you know, they just keep watching and watching and watching. So we made a movie that would make a Lifetime executive, you know, crap their pants, I think. <laughs> but, uh, you know, definitely not a Lifetime or, or a Hallmark movie, you know, right? Um, we made a darker comedy, but uh, we still had that Christmas genre. So it was an easy sell, you know, and, and I, I recommend they, they always say scary movies are easy sells. Um, I'm telling you right now, Christmas movies are easy <laughs> sells, and especially when you have a title called Worst Christmas Ever yeah. in the year 2020. It was uh, a lot yeah. of things happened just serendipitous for us. So, and when you're dealing with the uh somebody who's going to distribute your movie there's money involved mm -hmm. how 
concerning is that, I mean, you know, I've, I've listened to some horror stories with these bands. I've watched a lot of, on Netflix, documentaries with these bands yeah. and they get screwed out of all kinds of deals and money. Is that, I mean, did you have them sign like a non-disclosure or did you, or was it just good faith? Uh, are you saying with the distribution company then? Yeah. Somebody yeah, bought so, the movie, right? Is that the distribution people? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. They bought his movie. So they bought your movie. So, Is it yeah, just a one-off? Or are you well, getting, uh, you know, cuts from that? Actually, yeah, the way the way that, you know, we we have our deal is um, they are our, our conduit to all these platforms. They, they've gotten us on cable and video on demand in Canada and the U.S. And, uh, you know, they take like a percentage, right? That's kind of what they, from any sale. Um, and we signed a, a pretty long-term contract with them because, uh, you know, we have a window of release right now, which is, um, and I'll back it up a little bit. We premiered on election day this year. We premiered November 3rd. So four years after I wrote the thing, we actually premiered this movie <laughs> on election day. But wow. from, from election day until uh, February 1st, we're in a window oh. where people can rent or buy the movie. And because they can rent or buy the movie, um, you know, we have a, a big potential, right, for, for, uh, for profit there. Um, after that window, after that first window comes up, <laughs> my kids are funny. After my first, uh, after that window is up here, uh we move on to subscription services so they're going to try to get us on netflix or hulu or one of these subscription-based services um for 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 next christmas and what they would do is they would license the movie so then we would get paid from that um and like i said we we, we signed a kind of a long a long-term deal with the logic that this is a christmas movie that they can license every year Mm -hmm. and so you know not maybe every year won't be the worst christmas ever right right we, we might have we might have hit i you know while the iron was hot but uh but it's still a movie that can replay every year uh, and, but I, I, I don't know if you've answered my question though okay so you license a movie yeah he's getting a percentage yeah but how do you verify that who's got the who's looking at so the they, number they, they they release quarterly reports and they're under contract to do that um our distribution company uh luckily I, now, I don't trust people. Well, that I, yeah, I'm with you. Now, a, a lot of a lot of uh, you you'll hear music and film are very related, in the sense that there are many, many, many horror stories of distributors not paying the filmmaker. They'll say, they'll say, well, we had to spend X amount of dollars yeah. marketing your movie, and they'll make yeah. up funny numbers, right? Yeah. So. Thankfully, uh, we signed with a, with a company that has a very good reputation and amongst films big and small. Um, I actually knew a few people who uh, their film had gone through uh, uh, this company and I would reach out to them and pick their brain a little bit. And, uh, and everything I've heard was that they pay on time and that they're honest, you know, a good company to work with. So not, not always a... Uh, um, traits you hear with film distributors by any stretch of the imagination so did you know, they that, know that you've worked for like fox like did they treat you or know that that you worked for in hollywood and for fox and stuff or did they treat you like this is your first time and you didn't know anything you know oh uh, well i don't really know the that they knew my background personally mm -hmm. um they just saw the film and you know what they they knew that we didn't have big stars mm -hmm. in our movie. So right off the bat, our leverage is not as high, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know, we're, we're not a big budget movie. We don't have movie stars. So, um, but they were fair and honest. They were, you know, good negotiations and, and uh, you know, no complaints with them at all, especially, you know, from where we were at. And yeah. acknowledging, you know, we didn't have... Uh, a ton but they they did negotiate with us they they didn't you know they were they did compromise on certain things nice and, very uh, nice and it was well, i would think that where you're at also, at that point by the way you got to get a lawyer right you can't do this yourself don't i don't wouldn't recommend anybody negotiate that yourselves uh i i'm very fortunate that from my days at fox i have a, an entertainment attorney 
out oh, nice. in, in Southern California who I use on contracts and negotiations. So, you know, I, I, I just turned to my guy and. Okay. So yeah. you have somebody that got yeah, you back yeah. a little bit. <laughs> and I would think that, you know, when you're at that point and it's your first, you know, you almost are willing to sell. I don't know. Maybe it's just. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get almost it. Right. willing to settle for, for anything just, uh-huh. yeah, to go to the next level. But at some point I'm going, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, and who really it's, makes all the money in films? Is it the actor? Is it the director? Who who makes all the money? I the think that, it really depends. It's um the movie stars. If you have movie stars, they're making money for sure. Whether that's you know you on a bigger budget movie, Tom Cruise is getting a lot of it right off the bat. Uh, the smaller movies that these movie stars do, sometimes they make smaller movies, independent movies, uh, where they'll work for what they call scale, right? Which is like a base pay. Then they end up taking all the back end. So if the movie makes money at the end, yeah. then, then the actor makes all the money. I think honestly, that's where we need to go. Like all the, like Tom Cruise, Will Smith, when they're asking for like 50 million, I'm like, if you think you're worth that much, s- sell it with the back end points. Let that money go to the visual effects artist. Let it go to the crew. And then if you really think you're worth that money, it'll make the money back. And how, you'll get it. In how, a- how successful do you think? that argument would be with yeah it won't <laughs> yeah but it needs to be <laughs> well how many I just gonna say how many independent movies is tom cruise in these days yeah. <laughs> so you know it, it's it's everybody's in these businesses for, uh for for different reasons and same thing with music and and, and movies they're very similar if you're getting you're an independent movie, filmmaker like, right who you're an independent filmmaker at this point yeah <laughs> okay so is there any animosity that you're a, a independent guy I kind of see it like I'm going to go to court and be my own attorney and represent myself. Oh, yeah. Is like well, that? Is there, are there people looking at you going, eh, this independent guy? It's, it's, it's not animosity so much as it's, um, we're, we, we often get overlooked. You know, it, it's, it's, I, I mentioned to you that I come to Youngstown and people from Youngstown, they don't believe, I say I'm a filmmaker and they don't really believe me, right? They don't understand. They think, okay, he must be making YouTube. You know, mm-hmm. and that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in LA, you tell somebody you made a movie for twenty five thousand dollars or anything, and they'll they'll give you that look too. Like, yeah. oh, that's cute. That's cute. You know. Um, <laughs> cute. <laughs> so for me to 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 have a movie get this big distribution, like, I'm not kidding. If you look at Gravitas Ventures, they're releasing movies this year with uh, big stars, big stars, tons of them, and I guarantee you those movies had spent a lot more money than we did but we're in the same you know you can go to walmart.com and find our movie you can buy our movie on all X- xbox and playstations and you know all these different platforms that uh you can buy their movies on so you know it, it's it's we're a success in my opinion just for getting oh, yeah. It. yeah for sure uh we won't know our <clears throat> our initial figures this is a very interesting moment for me um they pay they do quarterly reports so we premiered november 3rd the quarter doesn't end until you know the end of december you know i i I really couldn't tell you right now how the movie's doing um i know that it's doing well because you know i i'll be able to see amazon sold out of dvds or something you know um but streaming wise you know i'm I'm just really hoping that that it's uh i mean look people aren't movie theaters aren't even open right now so people have to be searching these channels and and uh and i think it'll find an audience and we'll get lucky and and uh you know sam raimi didn't send me out here for nothing right you know it's it's uh, i got put on a path to come out here and and do it you may have answered this but was this your first one coming back or was it that documentary no this is my first one coming back i uh I think you already won then, you know, you left, you left Hollywood where, you know, and you went there and you did it. So successful or like crazy amounts of money or not, like you went back and you did it. Yeah. And you got a big distribution. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the, the money was never part of the plan. What are you guys Mm -hmm. doing over there? Just a nice big cherry on top. (laughs) So when, when we, um, when we set out, you know, to, to come back here and do this, um, completing it was the goal. And you got it, buddy? 
Okay, I'll help you out. Hold on. Big Brothers. I think that's amazing. Go ahead. Go. You know, a lot of people, I think, because uh, I hear that all the time, too. Like, oh, that's cute that you make movies. But uh, yeah. I think just being able to, like, go and do it is, like, that's such a success story. A lot of people oh. always want to be a writer or actor well, or a director, you know, and they just, don't. Yeah, it's like, <clears throat> you know, in a way, it's kind of like bodybuilding. To get up on stage and make that, the people that actually get on that stage mm-hmm. it's a very small because you don't realize how much it goes into for goodness sake four years yeah yeah into this well it yeah it's a commitment man it really is and and who in the hell can tolerate that i can't yeah, i don't yeah. think i don't know <laughs> so i i had written uh several screenplays that were kept getting optioned and purchased and and, and every time i every time it happened i thought this is it they're gonna make my movie hollywood's gonna make my movie i'm gonna my career begins now and they just never got made. None of these movies I, I sold ever got the financing and got the green light. So that was part of it was I got to do it myself. I'm going to make a movie myself for better or worse. You know, at least I can say I did it, get it done. And, uh, and, and here's a little factoid too. While we were making the movie, so we shot here in Ohio in the winter time, which is, you know, insane. Uh, I actually broke my elbow on the set of the movie. Um, we had filmed outside on a very cold day, um, long day. The cast and the crew, we wrapped, we finished the day, everybody left. And I was running around like a madman, just trying to make sure everything was back to the way we, we were filming at a house, somebody's house. And we want, I wanted to make sure that we left their house as nice as it was when we got there. And, you know, uh, uh, just be real respectful of this location. And I went outside and in a hurry to get to my car and come back, my feet went over my head and I slipped on a patch of ice oh, and God. broke my elbow. And, uh, you know, I was in a sling for the next four, couple of weeks, uh, but I was back on set the next day. And, you know, it was still fun. I didn't care. It was, it was, you know, a brief hiatus at the hospital that night, but uh, it was, you know, and thank God it was me that broke his elbow because yeah, we didn't have any insurance in this project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the good news is that you didn't break it really bad, but the bad news is there's no insurance. Yeah. 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 So it was, uh, it, it, you know, and, and God bless my wife at that point. She was, uh, all, all my all my three jobs I was doing, uh, I was on her her insurance from her job here. So it was all good. Do you edit your own films? I do. I do. Um, it's interesting. This film, uh, I told myself since I was going to be wearing so many hats as a writer, a producer, a director, that I that I should not edit the movie. Mm-hmm. I told myself I'll, I'll let someone else edit this movie. Um, and I, I learned a little bit too much about myself that I'm, I'm too much of a control freak. Mm-hmm. So I still ended up co-editing the movie. <laughs> um, you know, wasn't able to completely let it out of my hands yet um at that point i had edited everything i'd ever done before so i I had always done the editing myself and uh and it was a whole new experience working with working with uh basically a stranger you know we brought somebody on and uh you know it it was i learned like i said i learned a little bit about myself i'll probably go back to editing for sure after this too but uh, i think editing is like I'm an editor, so I may be biased, but I really think that's the one that really makes the movie because you could completely change it, like yeah. completely, you know? You could get three editors with the, the same script, the same directing, the yeah. same actors, and it'll be three totally different movies. Because it's, it's a, from their perspective. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they say, they say that there are three different movies that you make. There's the movie that you write, there's the movie that you shoot, and there, there's the movie that you edit. If that's not and, so true, you know the script from the script to the screen. So if I hear a, if I hear both of you guys correctly, and you're these big producers, you got you know you're real, you've made it. You would settle in and be the guy that does the editing. Is that right? Um, I love directing, but man, I I when you started saying like I couldn't I couldn't let him edit it, like I had to co-edit. I understand completely. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could direct and then sit back and watch someone edit without having any say. I don't know. 
Oh, it was, it was, it was hard. It was hard. It was uh, <laughs> let go of your baby. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically what it would be like, not babysitting, like someone taking your baby. Yeah. You have, you have to watch from afar. Yeah. And I, I thought I was being smart and, and by, by delegating that job and not having, you know, worrying about myself. But at that point, all the other jobs are done. So yeah, yeah. you don't, you know, it, I didn't realize that, but it, yeah, it's, at the point when you go to edit the movie, you've already shot it. You've already directed it. You've already written it. There's, you know, you can focus on editing it. So uh, it didn't really make a difference. Um, the funny thing is I don't have a passion for editing. Oh. I, I was, before I worked for Fox Sports, I, I worked as an editor in LA for, for two years and I didn't really enjoy it. And I think a lot of it might've been, I was editing other people's stuff. Yeah. And I didn't, wasn't passionate about that, but, um, I, I left that career. I, I could have had a career as just an editor and made really good money. There's my, my friends that are still doing that in Hollywood are making a very good living, um, editing. And it's just gotta be something you gotta be passionate about. For me personally, um, I don't really do much that I'm not passionate about. I think that's smart. Yeah. So, so you would choose you. So you would choose the directing then for yeah. sure. The honestly, uh, I love writing, directing, and producing, and not essentially all at the same time. But if I can be doing one of those things on a movie, I'll be a happy guy. At least one of those things. Yeah. So if I even if it's uh, you know, right now uh, somebody hired me to write a screenplay based on their life story. So I'm just going to write that movie. Somebody else is going to direct it. Um, I, I, I've met some very talented young filmmakers throughout this process, and I'm trying to help them with some of their projects, just produce their projects. I'm trying to help them make, let them make their own. And I really like producing for them. Um, I wouldn't mind if somebody, uh, uh, Charlie, if you had a script and you said, Hey, I want you to direct it. And you hired me to direct it. I would, I would consider that. I would, you know, I don't have to be the writer director. It doesn't have to be that combination Mm -hmm. uh, as long as I'm doing one of those three things, I'd be pretty happy. So does a guy like Scorsese, is he oversight? Then he has this, these people that are in these different areas. And then he's like, in other words, he's not just turning everything over. He's got his hands in it. Yeah. It's just a question of how yeah. much, right? Yeah. He, it probably a lot because his name's on it. Well, and, 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 you know, what's interesting is like Martin Scorsese, for the most part, he just directs these days. He doesn't write, he doesn't edit, he doesn't do, he has other people do those, you know, that, that handle those tasks. He'll find a script that somebody else wrote that he'll want to direct. Okay. Uh, he works with uh, uh, Thelma Schoenmaker, Schoenmaker, I think is her name, uh, this wonderful editor. You know, she does all the editing. So he really gets to focus on directing, working with the actors, setting the tone, setting the mood. And he's very hands-on and, and, and um, crafts that movie from that sense is he one of those people that probably have the because a lot of people will have like the same uh like christopher nolan will always bring in like the same uh a dp and the same audio uh you know hans zimmer or whatever yeah, and, yeah, yeah like a lot yeah you know scorsese i think is a little bit different um especially with his last movie that he made for netflix they i know they did something they, they did it completely different they they shot they shot with uh uh, nine cameras or something last time. And I, I watched a whole a whole special where he talked about all the new challenges that he was doing. Um, so I think he mixes it up a little bit, but you know everybody's kind of different. Um, some people have the same the same crew that they work with a lot. Um, Tarantino's used a, a a variety, but he right now he sticks with uh, the same the same dish, director of photography. Yeah, so. It's uh, it's all, you know, relationships and, uh, mm -hmm. and finding people that you work with. Me personally, uh, I was on a lot of sets in LA. I, I did TV shows, movies. I was an extra. I was a production assistant. I was a grip. I worked in the offices. I, I did everything you could do on the way up the ladder. And I took away one key lesson. That when we made this movie, I told everybody on set, I said, okay, I have one rule. 
you have to have fun because if we're not having fun, what are you doing here? Yeah. You know, I said, you can be go, you can work at McDonald's and not have fun. You know what I mean? I think that's, that's a, a very cool thing to say, but when you're talking about dealing with these, again, I, I'm, maybe I'm saying something I really don't, I have that this misunderstanding, but when you're dealing with top big, big actors, I think with big, big actors, not all comes big, big egos. Oh yeah. And drama. Prima Donnas. Prima Donnas. And when you're a director and you're saying, no, I want it done this way. I wouldn't imagine that that's going to be too fun at times. In, in the, yeah. In the film, well, it? that's uh that was another approach that it was calculated on my behalf, which was, I was going to make a small movie on purpose because with a smaller movie, you have less expectations, you have less pressure, less stress, and no one else is telling you how it has to be. Yeah. You make, you make a million dollar movie out of the gate. Say that's your first movie, a million dollars. You've got a million dollars of somebody's money and there's stress already immediately attached to it. So the, the fun <laughs> level already drops a little bit. I mean, you might have fun spending their money, but, uh, but you know, you, it, it's more of a, a nerve wracking kind of thing. So I, I've seen it where, yeah, I mean, I don't want to name names, but there were some, uh, there's, there's some Hollywood actors, big ones that, that are jerks, right. That are prima donnas that definitely don't have fun. I don't know what they're clearly doing it for a paycheck. Um, just but, the passion you know yeah that's that's and i would imagine you know at some point they became jaded because every i would you know they would have had to have started off like the rest of us mm -hmm. um i would imagine why else would they get in this industry but they have to uh you know show up to set every day like the rest of us and if you're not having fun uh and that goes back to casting as well we did we we searched a lot for our cast we got people from we brought in a, a an actor from LA, from Buffalo, from Cincinnati, from Cleveland, um, from Pennsylvania. We brought people in from all over. We did auditions. And one of the key things I wanted to look at was how are these people personally? Can or do, do we get along? Are they fun to be around? Because if we're going to be out in the freezing cold temperatures for 12, 14, 16 hour days sometimes, you're going to learn somebody's, you know, what they're really like really fast. And yeah, the honeymoon's going to wear off. Yeah, real fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that actually played a part for, for a little bit of, you know, one of the roles. Um, we, were, we had somebody kind of cast, and we ended up making a change pretty late in the game, um, and it worked out for the best. And it was, it was – a lot of it had to do with, with – uh, come here, bud. You got to come over here. A lot of it had to do with personality and – you know, uh, demeanor and, and how they were, were they good people? And were they going to have fun? And if they weren't going to have fun, you know, no offense, but hit the bricks. You got to go somewhere else. So, so is the director like in on the auditions? Like hands yeah, on? Yeah, it thing? should be. Hopefully. And, and, and a low budget. <laughs> what you're saying, I would think, yes, they would be real hands on. In a, in a, in a low budget or independent movie, yes. Uh, the bigger studio movies, they'll have a big casting director and who will do most of the casting and then they'll bring it to the director and they'll say, look at these people. And the director will say, I like that one and that one. Okay. And then they'll come, they'll come and do a, they'll meet the director and that's how they pick it. But for, for a movie, our size. Yeah. I was there from day one, you know, every step of the way for, for, uh, for casting. There's something to be said from learning it from the ground up. Yeah. I need you to do me a favor, Gio. Say bye, Leo. Then take little Leo. That's that's Leo, little guy's Leo. Hey, hey. Take little. I like Leo. you better now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, take him out there, okay? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Hi, Gio. So, all right. What, Gio. what were you a uh, extra on? I was an extra on the West Wing, the final season of the West Wing. I'm following uh, Allison Janney, a great actress. I'm following her around the White House with binders and papers and, and things of that nature. I'm in, uh, I was the oldest looking teenager in a show called Seventh Heaven. Oh, I remember uh, that. <laughs> I'm in the background of the hallways. 
you know, walking past the classroom nine times. Um, <laughs> I assume and, these are all non-speaking parts. Yeah, ex extras. You're you're literally background actors. Yeah, okay. And it's kind of like my kids here. They're extras in this interview. <laughs> they're extras. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we I, then I I started doing production assistant work for television shows like Ugly Betty, The Closer. Um, I worked with Robert Davi on a, on a movie of his, uh, The Dukes, as a, as a, a production assistant. And yeah, those kind of just getting your start. I, I, my first production assistant job, uh, to pay the bills, I was, I was working at like a GNC, okay, at the mall and trying to get on movie sets. And one day we got a phone call at the apartment and it was for my roommate and he wasn't home. And they were offering him a job on a big CBS television show called uh, Night called Kojak Night Stalker. They were they were remaking Kojak. Do you remember Kojak, Leo? The yeah, old, I do. Yeah, the old the old Savalas. Uh, yeah, Telly Savalas. Yeah. So they were remaking the show with an actress named Gabrielle Union, and uh, they they called my friend. Somebody called my, my my roommate to see if he wanted to 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 work on the show, and I took the message. And uh, he couldn't do it. He had to pass on it because he had another job. But he said, you should do it. So I got the gig. I quit GNC the next day. I said, see you later. I'm working for CBS now. <laughs> we went downtown Los Angeles. Uh, my first responsibility is to clear an alleyway of like crazy, you know, stragglers and, you know, junkies or whatever and to clear this alleyway of people so that they, they could shoot a scene. And I said, okay, you know, so I'm over there trying to convince you know, these poor people to, that they need to move over to the other side. And they're setting up the camera. They're shooting on 35 millimeter. Um, this is 2006. Uh, Gabrielle Union shows up to set. She's a big movie star. She's all makeup, all that stuff. They get it ready. They get the lights ready. It takes about another hour. They get all, everything set up. And they go to call action, and then there's a call from the producer that says, uh, "Everybody, please come to base camp. We have a, a, a meeting at base camp." We show up. They canceled the show, and because oh. they shot on film back then, it was the show's been canceled. Don't shoot another frame. Save the film because film costs a lot of money. Yeah. So immediately the whole i was there for three hours or something and then the show got canceled that was that was a wake-up call for me and then i begged gnc to hire me back yeah so that was rough that was the beginning and trying to Oof. trying to get on it you know seeing how hey, you know something is better to learn those lessons early on yeah right <laughs> you know what i mean absolutely absolutely and and uh you know LA, I mentioned the word dejected and, and you know, people get uh, jaded, right? Uh, that's why these big movie stars, you know, might become the way they do. They get jaded on the film business and a lot of people out there get jaded and I was starting to get jaded myself after like eight, nine years. Um, I, I kind of felt like I was getting stuck in sports and I would show up to work on a movie lot, studio lot and I, I walk by they're shooting the show House right here. And they're shooting It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia over here and Modern Family over there. And I walk into the sports building and, you know, I'm literally looking out my window at, at you know, hey, there's Lady Gaga. She's shooting something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, uh, and it was cool. I'm, I'm hanging out with athletes and, and that was fun. But, you know, uh, sports for me are, are, a, are a hobby, not a passion. Uh, m movies are my passion. It's not where the heart so, was. Yeah. yeah. Well, some actors they they they're concerned about being pigeonholed. Like a, they only do certain types of movies, and some like to keep that their options a lot more. Hollywood likes personal. to pigeonhole people. They really do. They do pigeonhole yeah. people. And even me, uh, you know, I'm not an actor by any stretch, but I was I was pigeonholed as a sports guy, as a yeah. sports writer. And yeah. So. It was getting harder and harder for me to get more screenplay gigs and screenwriting yeah. gigs because uh, I was I had written for the UFC, um, just you know one of one of my hobbies. I I practiced uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and 
I wrestled. I grew up wrestling in Ohio. I had a big, big uh, uh, love for, you know, amateur wrestling and UFC and, and jujitsu and those kind of grappling yeah. competitions and boxing. I love boxing too. Um, but even, even in one of the reviews for worst Christmas ever, uh, somebody, somebody gave a, re- we, we got a not so good review and it said they were going on about my, my UFC writing days. Like, well, I don't know what that has anything to do with the movie. Right. But they just love, they love to pigeonhole you. And, uh, okay. and, and, you know, so that's just the way Hollywood is. So, you know, it's It'd be hard for me to take, like, look at a review of a, something I've done. Yeah. I mean, I've been judged, you know, along the way as an athlete and bodybuilder, you get rejected all the time and oh, not and it, but it's to see somebody go. How did you, ha- Leo, how, how did you handle that? So say you, say you were, you were, what, what was like, uh, what was a horror story for you as far as like getting rejected or, or I think, whatever? I think the worst thing was that I, I still remember it was in Fresno. You don't, you don't forget stuff like that. And it was like, you know, you had to make the top three to get a, like a trophy. And I didn't make the top three. And I was like, oh, my God. I mean, I just felt so. Uh, but you know what happens is, uh, is you get your ass kicked mm-hmm. and you lick your wounds yeah, and give it some time for it to be become more objective. Because at that point in the beginning, it's very subjective. The feelings are just really raw. Yeah. Type thing. But I, I think just time. Yeah. And then, you know, like you, I have passion for what I did. Yeah. I wasn't gonna let somebody in the end, you know, that didn't like me, a judge or whatever. I wasn't yeah. gonna let them I almost used that as, you know, fodder or energy to I overcome. Th- I think that every just everybody has a different a, a view of it, of like every single like movie or anything, you know, yeah, like but, but it's hard not to take it personal. I don't know. I like a uh, creative criticism because when i like so i do a lot of youtube videos and so you know how those will be like there'll be like five that are like just one word but cool and i'm like what does cool do you know what i mean or you'll see the youtube comments that are like this is the worst thing i've ever seen in my life it is always yeah the absolute worst right so yeah Yeah. (laughs) they're like you're a waste of life never pick up a camera again so i like the the ones in between that were like you know hey this was really fun to watch but your camera yeah. was a little shaky. Course, I'm like, cool, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, I was watching uh, that show that there's a whole bunch of professional singers, and but they're they're masked. Oh, the mask singer. Yeah, I was watching that last night, and uh, so it was down to five people, and somebody was getting kicked off, and they were all like, the judges were like, and you get a guess who it is, and they're like, we think it's Seal, and I was like, there's no way Seal's getting kicked. That wouldn't be Seal because Seal wouldn't get kicked off. Seal's yeah. like one of the best singers in the world. It was Seal. Oh man. You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't know. Like everybody has an off day. Sometimes you just don't hit. You know what I mean? So, the best of yeah. So and, I don't know. And it's also what you said, you know, what you said a few minutes ago of uh everything's subjective. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I was equating it to this. Me personally, when I see like a bad review or something, uh I I kind of laugh it off because I think to myself, well, you know, who even is who is this person, you know, right? Mm-hmm. Uh uh what's his name Who, who's the most revered movie critic of all time was it robert robert uh roger ebert right yeah yeah e- e- ebert siskel and ebert right yeah, yeah, yeah. roger ebert uh i don't know what you know if you guys know the old chris farley movie tommy boy yeah, yeah. tommy boy one of my uh childhood favorites right you know i, I grew up kind of on that movie and uh roger ebert who who won a Pulitzer Prize for his film criticism? They gave him a Pulitzer Prize for his criticism. Uh, called Tommy Boy a genuinely not funny movie with no memorable lines, and you know it would quickly be forgotten. Uh, and here I am, all these years later, singing you know fat guy in a little coat, and uh, and quoting Chris Farley in that movie all the time. And, uh, and I just thought to myself, you know, how off was he? Yeah. And he's supposed to be the greatest film critic, you know, there is. Exactly. And, and it's so subjective, right? Yep. So I, I, I equate it to, like, you go to a museum and say there's, like, uh, the Renaissance aisle or, or hallway. And there was a guy, there'd be a guy at the end of the hallway, and he would just go, no, don't go down there. It sucks. 
Yeah. And people would go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to go down there. And mm-hmm. it's like, you have to experience art for yourselves. Yeah. Um, get your own opinion off of it. And Well, uh, you know, it's like in sports, you know, when a, a, how many times have you seen a team that should have never – and any given Sunday, and that was a movie, by the way, you probably know that, <laughs> why, how they could knock this, you know, the team that's so heavily favored, and, and yet they do, and that's the reason why you play the games. Yeah. And I think to an extent, this is what we're talking about. You know, yeah. it's not easy. It's not for everybody. Yeah. And well, it, it's funny that, you know, like you had said that, you know, you they, a, a bad review or something would crush you, right? So for me, I kind of laugh it off. Uh, I've learned the hard way that uh, don't tell your actors there's a bad review. Yeah. <laughs> actors, actors are generally a little more vain. You know, it's, it's in their profession. Yeah. Uh, they take it real, real, real to heart. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's the Internet. It's uh, you look at YouTube. It's like, you know, that the trolls come out. You know what I mean? But yeah. you know something, all the stuff that we're talking about is the difference between, you know, there's certain people that do make it. But it's not for everybody. It's for the people. They like. This is kind of my point. For you to continue to go on and have this much against you at times. Listen, I'd be lying to you if I told you these some of these reviews or comments that I get. It doesn't sting. Yeah, it hurts. Sure, sure. sure. You know, but the, if you love it enough to overcome those obstacles, those are the yeah. ones that end up making it or have a better chance of making it. There's there's a great uh, um, Teddy. Yeah. There's a great Teddy. Oh, mommy's home. So guess what? Here, Leo, go see mommy. Go see mommy. Okay. Go see mommy. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So there's a great Teddy Roosevelt quote um, where it says something to the effect of, you know, don't celebrate the critic, the person who, the person who tells the strong man they're not strong enough or the doer of deeds that they didn't do them well enough. Yeah. It says the respect goes to the, the the man in the arena. There you go. And I thought that's that's like a great that. quote. That's a Teddy Roosevelt quote. Yeah. And I think Tom Brady uses that quote. Uh, I'm not a big Patriots fan, but I respect Tom Brady. And uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, that's a fantastic quote for any any creator. And and I also think about this. This is this is true. We live in an era now where there is more critics than creators. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been a time in history where you know, come over here, where there's been more critics than there are now with Twitter and yeah. social media. Everybody, Literally everyone everything. everyone is a critic now. And YouTube, that's that's what a comment section is. Yeah. yeah. That's all it is. So it makes it makes it even sweeter when you make it. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. There are more there are now for the first time in history more critics than there are creators, probably. So well, we're gonna go ahead and uh uh, leave it there on a really positive note with a with, uh, Roosevelt quote. I like that one. I'm going to remember that. Hey, Johnny, I just added you on Instagram. I would love to check out some of your stuff if you want to uh, send me any Absolutely. like links or just titles of your movies, and I, I would love to see them. Great. And yeah. I, would, uh, I really want to thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. Um, we will be doing a uh, – Joe's the one, obviously, that, that mentioned that uh, he thought you'd be – uh, interesting um, interview, and you were, and so I appreciate you coming on. I really do. Oh, thank you very much. And anyway, thank continued you. success. Thank you. And uh, if you got anybody, anything else that you'd like to come talk about one of these days, just reach back out to us. All right, we'll do. Thank you. All right. You nice meeting care. you. Nice meeting you. Yes. Appreciate Bye. it.